I'm John Golia. And I'm Greg Fife. And we are the, the Flight, Flight Safety, Safety Detectives. Detectives. We're just two guys who have spent most of their career with the National Transportation Safety Board investigating aircraft disasters and aviation safety issues all over the world. Yep, and this podcast is where we talk about everything from accidents, airplane technology, to the big business of aviation. We live and breathe aviation. My co-host John has been in the aviation business for more than 60 years. He was the first and only airframe and power plant mechanic to get a presidential appointment to the National Transportation Safety Board. And Greg is a former air safety investigator and go team captain for the NTSB. He's investigated everything that flies worldwide since he started his career 40 years ago. And on top of that, he is a living legend of aviation inductee. So between John and myself, we have over 100 years of aviation safety experience. It's time to buckle up because it's going to be wheels up. Let's get this show in the air. Well, hello, John. I'm glad that we are together again virtually for another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. I think we have a great show today, but before we get into it, how are you doing? I know that we're still in the COVID lockdown and there's a lot of banter going on around this virus and it's wearing on a lot of people. We just came through the holidays now and I think people are really itching now that the vaccine is out. I can't wait to get a shot, get this behind us. They're giving them out uh, pretty robustly here in Massachusetts because we we have a very high rate. So it's got a lot of people concerned. So they have been uh, going at it strong all week. So let's hope that they uh, get it down. I'm, I got my number already. I'm a 1C. So the medical professionals are all 1As. And I don't know who B is, but I've been told I'm 1C. <laughs> Yeah, well, there's trouble right there. I'll be in that line as quickly as I can. Yeah, well, I know that you've been doing your part. You've been in COVID lockdown. You don't stray very far from your house, so I'm glad you're doing your part. I can't say the same because I'm doing my part to protect everybody else, but I've still been traveling. I've got a lot of work going on around the world and still doing accident investigations, so... It is interesting that we've talked to some folks uh, recently, not only on the show, but we get emails from, I still get emails from around the world from people that have told me, hey, I was just on an airplane and they didn't do the mask briefing. And then some of them are saying, they must have been listening to your show because now the flight attendants are telling you to take your personal mask off to put the oxygen mask on. So I think that maybe we're having a bit of an impact in aviation safety. Let's hope so. Well, today we have a couple of special guests with us. We're going to talk about an accident that occurred back in 2006. And the two people that we're going to have on the the program, Joan and Yachis. uh, Yoshi. Yachis. Hey, I have trouble with English, so... Ah, you got to get rid of that Boston accent. That's the problem. See, that's screwing up your pronunciation. It's Yatish and Joan. Joshi. <laughs> it's perfect Indian English. I like it. Oh, yeah. The Boston accent, yes. Everybody makes fun of the way I talk. <laughs> As they should. Okay, oh, so... <laughs> All right, so welcome to the show. We know the message that you're putting out there, and we happen to agree with that message considerably because of the quality of the investigations that we've been seeing coming out of the federal government, particularly the NTSB, but also the FAA, leaves a lot to be desired. So we're hoping that maybe we can shed a little light on what's what's going on in that area and, and drive some improvement, just like we did with the masks. With the, Well, actually, it's not the mask, but it's the announcement for the mask. Yeah, absolutely. And this is an accident that, of course, with uh, with our guest today, hits close to home because it was their 24-year-old daughter who was the pilot of a Cessna 206. This is an accident, as John said, that occurred back in 2006. She was not only a student as far as education is concerned, but she was an accomplished opera singer. And she was using the airplane. She had been flying this airplane quite a bit. Her father is an accomplished pilot. 
And so she uh, was using this airplane both for pleasure and, and actually personal service. She was flying herself and four of her colleagues, if you will. They were students and friends, and they were on a return flight back to Bloomington, Indiana at night. The weather was IMC. She had gotten a weather briefing before she departed. It was late at night. I think it was around 1045 or thereabouts. It was a short flight. They were coming from Lafayette to uh, Bloomington. And she had filed an IFR flight plan for the flight. And during the course of executing an ILS approach to runway 35, somewhere along the flight path, aircraft control, depending on how you read the NTSB, whether it was a loss of control or a failure to control the altitude, the aircraft ended up striking trees, and unfortunately, all five folks on board were killed. Yatish and Joan have made it their mission since their daughter's death to not only at least heighten the awareness of the public to what they see are not only inaccuracies, but inadequacies of the investigative process conducted by the NTSB. And John and I have talked about this on previous shows about the board and a lot of their shortcomings when it comes to accident investigation as a whole, but specifically general aviation accidents, because they have a tendency to shortcut the system. And in using at least COVID, as we've talked about on previous shows, they haven't been going out at all. But this was a case where the NTSB did, in fact, send an investigator to the accident site. They were assisted by two members of the FAA and then the aircraft manufacturer and the engine manufacturer. With that being said, where you have a small team of investigators, you expect a thorough and methodical investigation. You delegate authority, you delegate duties and responsibilities to conduct that type of investigation. Not only going out and kicking tin, as we call it in the business, but going out, ferreting out witnesses, looking at all of the radio communications, the air traffic control communications, the handling by air traffic control of the flight, the two-way communications. Were they providing proper radar services? Things like that. So it's a very encompassing process. It has to be done in a thorough and methodical and very deliberate manner. It's very easy when you start to get some of the factual information about this particular pilot, because unfortunately, I've seen it in the past. We continue to see it now. And that is you got a low time pilot. And again, John and I have talked about this with regard to the quote flight hours as being experienced. There are pilots that have 500 hours of total flight time that I'd fly with any time versus pilots with 5,000 hours of flight time. I wouldn't get in the same airplane. It's all about maturity, decision making, aeronautical skills, abilities, and knowledge. There's a variety of different things. So you can't basically classify that a pilot, and in this case, Georgina, who is the Joshi's daughter, she had about 380 hours of total flight time. A lot of it was in this high-performance complex airplane, the, the U-206, and it was a relatively new airplane, as I recall. And when you look at her experience, the amount of flying she had been doing, of course, that experience level always it's factored in and it's obvious in this investigation. That was one of the things that the board found information about, but then figured it into their analysis and probable cause. But when you look at the gravity of the situation, that is when you start looking at all of this information and you dissect the facts, conditions, and circumstances, there are still a number of unknowns with regard to having questions and answers. And the board's investigation, they came out with a very simplistic determination after collecting what they believe were all the facts, conditions, and circumstances, which the Joshis will talk about here, wasn't all the facts, conditions, and circumstances. But the board came out with a probable cause 
that basically concluded that because of her experience or lack thereof and her failure to maintain a proper altitude while executing an ILS approach at night in IMC conditions, the airplane ended up striking the trees and everyone was killed. Yatish, in looking at the quality of the investigation as it was progressing right after the accident, you're an accomplished pilot. You've been around. You you understand a lot of the issues that in any accident would be investigated because you are a pilot. So what was your initial feeling about the investigative process as it was being conducted? Our initial feeling was that investigation was they were doing a good job at the crash, crash site. They cordoned off the whole area. And when we realized that NTSB coming to investigate the accident, for that moment, me and my wife felt so relieved that, wow, NTSB will investigate and will find out the truth, what happened. And then as time progressed? As the time progressed, I realized that NTSB did not do anything, absolutely zero thing. The NTSB investigator came from Chicago. He went to the crash site, examined the things. He came out and asked me that if I want to go down to the crash site. And I was not in the position emotionally or mentally to go down there. But my wife insisted I should go with the investigator. So I went with the investigator. So there were two FA employees on the site. According to NTSP, they were deputized to investigate the accident. Uh, they talked to me. They showed me the, how the plane came down almost 90 degree vertical. They showed me the where the plane nose hit the, about maybe 50 feet from the ground and how the wingspan tore off because the tree within the plane was about 50 feet or 48 feet, something like that. So they were telling me that the plane came down, stalled the plane, and the plane came down kind of 90 degrees. Okay. And they explained to me step by step what, what they found. And at that point, how did you feel with that explanation? Did it sound reasonable up to that point based on what they explained and, and you as a pilot, what, what you were piecing together? Yes, uh, looking at the damage in the tree line, uh, looking at the plane coming down, their explanation, and all the debris within the such a short radius, I do realize that, yes, plane did stall, and all the things going in my mind of how plane gets stalled, why, what, what she did. That she really pulled the rudder up and she went up straight because of the height came down. There are lots of emotion and thought going in that something went in the engine fail, no enough fuel, or whatever reason, all the various thinking was going in my mind, could have understood why that happened. And given the fact that you and your daughter have flown together based on the statement that her flight instructor had given to the NTSB and what uh, we'll talk about here at the end of the show is, is the movie you all have produced. But the flight instructor had nothing but glowing words for Georgina with regard to her skills, abilities and knowledge as a pilot. They're absolutely correct. Um, in fact, when Georgina went, me and Georgina both took the IFR, IFR return exam together. She finished her exam within about an hour and a half, and, and, and I stayed for all three hours mm-hmm. to finish my exam. So she knew her subject very well, and when she went for her IFR flight test, in the flight test instructor plus the FA examiner, they asked Georgina, if the FA examiner can sit with in her plane to examine the instructor while instructor examining Georgina. And Georgina said, no problem, that sounds good. So they took the one hour, hour and a half flight, step by step, and we landed the plane and uh, instructor told Georgina, thank you very much. And there you pass. And Georgina get off the plane. And FA instructor told the examiner that how professional she flew the plane and she compared her like an Air Force pilot, the people, their precision she was flying. 
and normally according to Georgian instructor at, at home, the normal examiner write down in the logbook, fail or pass, and that's it. They don't write down anything you have failed, just yes. pass. In Georgian logbook, they wrote down, very good. And I, we never noticed that, but he pointed out, said this is something very unusual, normally they don't do that. Yes. Now, I mean, every once in a while, I'm going to throw my investigator hat on and ask questions. One of the things, because there are, you know, people that are in the know are going to ask probably similar questions. And that is when I was reading through the report, the one thing I didn't notice in the report was how much total flight time at night your daughter had and how comfortable she may have been flying at night IFR in these types of conditions. I don't recall exactly how many hours, but I think she had about 59 hours. And the Bloomington, if you know about Bloomington, it is in the valley. Uh -huh. So the fog comes in just like that, and overcast and low ceilings. And in fact, Georgina flew with her instructor, her training instructor, several times back and forth. That was Georgina's plane. She used to fly from Bloomington to South Bend all the time, all the weekend. So she, and, uh, and when the weather really goes bad in Bloomington, her alternate plan is to land in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Because when she travels, goes at night, the normally after 9 o'clock, the tower is closed. And she never took any chances. So she landed in Indianapolis. She either rent the car or stay overnight and fly back next day. In fact, uh, during one of her training sessions with the instructor, they flew to Bloomington. And weather was 200 foot ceiling. There's a minimum for ILS approach to runway 35. And she approached there absolutely perfectly. When uh, the doing instructor told Georgina, hey, the visibility dropped 200 feet. Georgina immediately did a misapproach without asking a single question, no, even knowing the ceiling only 200 feet. But instructor asked, hey, there is a 100 foot ceiling. And without asking any question, she just took the misapproach and took around the airport. And then now, she landed, coming back again, and she said, okay, go ahead and land the plane. So she landed in that type of 200 feet ceiling with very low visibility with the instructor, and she used to fly all the time. And she used to do, she never took any chances whatsoever if the ceiling is uh, lower than minimum. So when, when we look at this, I mean, of course, you look at the weather, she had gotten a weather briefing before she took off, she was, uh, asking to go VFR, but as the briefer started getting into some of the in-route weather, he was talking about the fact that it was going to be IFR at destination, which then changed her mind, and she decided to file IFR. And again, people are going to go, well, this is her parents talking, so they're always going to talk glowingly. But, you know, trying to get a candid perspective, because as an investigator, I'd be asking you, because you are a pilot, how comfortable was she? I know that she did well in the test environment, but how comfortable would she have been flying at night into an airport like this in those weather conditions? I mean, was she a confident woman? I know that she was uh, an accomplished opera singer, so I presume she had a, a high level of confidence. But did that translate into the airplane? Yeah, it did translate into the airplane uh, significantly. Or in fact, when she was better pilot than... She was opera singer at that time. And as a father, yes, that I'm saying, but if you ask the people uh, who flew with her, if you ask her instructor, in fact, the, the, her four friends who flying with her, the, one of the two friends flew with her quite often. Georgina took them around the flying. If you ask their parents and what they told about Georgina, they had a 100% conference in Georgina. And uh, this type of weather in the night, she flew all the time because she flew over the weekends from Bloomington to South Bend and vice versa. And uh, she finished her classes, uh, finished her uh, uh, singing practices, and she come to South Bend sometime in the night. Around 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, I go to airport and pick her up from the South Bend. And same thing, she left for Sunday night to go to Bloomington for the Monday morning. So she flew the night 
all the time. And with that in mind, you know, again, I put my investigator hat on. This is not the latest at night, but it's it's late at night. It's coming. It's you know, I think it was uh, 1140 at night. Had anybody talked to you about fatigue and what kind of day she had? Because that's always something that we're looking at, not only in big airplanes, but of course, small aircraft. Because, I mean, I use my airplane. I go to work all day and then I decide to fly at night. That makes for a long day. No, you are correct. Uh, on that day, Georgina had a one class. And uh, no, they flew in the morning around I think, 11 o'clock in the morning to Lafayette for this rehearsal. They could perform in uh, auditorio, Mozart auditorio, a requiem. So she had a one class, and then she flew. And when and she checked the weather, and it was weather forecast was VFR all day long in Lafayette and the Bloomington. And uh, when they land, not even in the afternoon. I'm sorry, in the afternoon. Yeah. And they had a two, three hours of practice session for, for, for the performance. And uh, so, and uh, the, in the performance, they were singing the Mozart Requiem. That was her favorite piece. And she sang that Mozart Requiem in Bloomington year before that. Uh-huh. It was a very joyful for practicing was you know, kind of stressful. It was something they all enjoyed, whole group enjoyed significantly. And for Georgina, the plan was the way she can able to really relax. Her mind, all the pressure she had or whatever it is, as you see in the plan, she just became totally different person. Mm-hmm. So yes, her work, work, whole day long work, they could uh, according to people, most of uh, do contribute the stress and uh, possibly accident. But in particular, this particular case, the, the real sir went very well. They were all their friends and they're doing something. And you've listened, I presume, to the the audio recordings, the two-way radio communications between your daughter and the various ATC facilities. That's correct. You, yes, did, yes, we do have radio with voice recording. And did you hear anything in those transmissions that gave you any kind of pause or concern that the investigators didn't pick up on or you brought to their attention? In fact, uh, every single time controller talked to her and she talked back, she talked very professionally. Her voice was very calm and there was no indication whatsoever. Anything was wrong. Mm-hmm. And, and so examiner never asked. I mean, the investigator never asked or told us that they found some kind of distress in her voice or way that she was responding to the instructor or uh, no instructor, uh, air traffic controller. Sure. And in looking at some of the uh, communications, it's obvious that she knew what she wanted. She asked for it. There were a couple of things that, if I remember right, in reading some of the judicial or the litigation information, the FAA was found to have not done the best of jobs in handling your daughter as she was flying this aircraft. Can you just give us a a synoptic of what that was all about? Yes. The controller who was controlling Georgina's flight went hand over to controller in Indianapolis for a approach to Bloomington. Their controller had 10 minutes of training how to land the plane, how to uh, instruct a plane to land on the Bloomington airport in the night. He had a whole 10 minutes of experience, that's it. Reading on the computer, that's it, nothing else. There are several controller called us after the accident, sympathizing, and they want to come forward and talk to us what, how much the controller was untrained. But they could not because they were going to lose their job if they speak up. So why didn't the NTSB pursue that? Exactly. That is a million-dollar question, correct? NTSB, that's what I'm saying. NTSB absolutely did not do anything. And even after you brought this to their attention, how did they justify that 
that that yeah. wasn't an issue. I think uh, what happened before NTSB came the picture, we could have to go to NTSB directly. We had to deal with the FAA first. So NTSB final report we took about a year and a half, and uh, we couldn't do anything. We couldn't get any information because it, it is one investigation. And they told us that if we interfere in, in the investigation, we could be liable. So we just sit back, did nothing for a year and a half. And the NTSB report came out, just like initial finding, young pilot, no, low experience, uh, bad weather, and sea crashed. It took yeah. three and plane crash. But with the FAA, we trying to settle the, tell the FAA that how poor the controller was. But FAA wouldn't even admit. So we end up finding, file, filing the lawsuit against FAA. It took about two, three years and taking the depositions of all the controllers. Then the truth came out that the controller who was directing Georgina's flight had a 10 minute experience. And the controller in the tower next to him, they were just shocked that what he was doing. He kept Georgina 5,000 feet. When she was on the, on the going in the downwind at 5,000 feet. Yes. I remember seeing that in the radar plots, and I was wondering, they had cleared her down to 4,000 feet, but, I mean, that was shortly before they turned her on to the, the local, they, they extended her, but then they turned her on to the localizer, and she was still high because the, the radar indicates that she was tracking above the glide slope for the ILS. She was above the glass above the glass of the ILS. And if you look at the flight path, her speed and angle of descent were absolutely precise. Throughout the flight, she was about 100 to 200 feet above the glide slope. But oh. her speed it was totally under control. And FA report showed, I mean, this report showed that Georgia was going 200 miles per hour approaching yeah. the ILS approach. So they even didn't know how to Captain airspeed, even their own radar data shows that she was going about 90 to 100 miles per hour approaching and slowing the speed down. And they were showing 200 miles per hour when she was about five miles from the airport. And when this investigation came to fruition, after basically you and your wife sitting idle, when you read the report, the factual and, of course, the analysis and probable cause, I mean, how did you feel? Did you, I mean, it's it's obvious that we're talking about it, but how did that make you feel at that moment? You know, Greg uh, and John, it was hard to describe. We were totally devastated. We were totally devastated because we knew our daughter and we knew how good of a pilot she was. And, uh, and blaming 100% on Georgina, knowing at that time we didn't knew the controller experience we didn't know anything about what happened. So, but we told the that we absolutely no idea what went wrong. So we started investigating after a year and a half. And what we discovered, the Georgina's mother, Louise, that finally we were able to get the people 911 call, location where they call from. And she always told me that there has to be second plan and there goes the crash. Yeah. But so after a year and a half, we have to finally get the 911 call, people, addresses. And she plotted the addresses on the Google chat. And she discovered something startling. That all the, most of the call came from the east side of the airport. Georgina was coming from the west side. And every single person, if you look at the 911 call, every single people said the plane was so low, just like they going to crash, you're just going over my roof. And I just woke up. They started and woke me up. Plane was that low. Mm. And if you look at the radar data, Georgia kept Georgia such a high. 5,000 feet, 4,000 feet. And she was always 200 feet above the glass slope, coming from south to north, landing on runway 35. But most of the call came from the east side. Uh-huh. So and we inform our attorneys, wait a minute, that this doesn't make sense. So I tried to talk to FA, they wouldn't answer any questions. Try to call NTSB and NTSB tell us that they had nothing to do with it. Uh, you had to go through the sequence of the the way legal approach. And because of that, we realized that there absolutely 
what happened is not Jojana. They did not hear the Jojana thing. Had to be somebody else there. Yeah. So we come up with our own hypothetical flight path of the second plane. Uh, plan A is the Georgina path. Plan B could be second plane coming from east to west, can land on the runway 35. Scenario C, where plane coming from the north, can do land on runway 24, northeast, can do land on runway 24, could not be able to land because weather was so bad. He turned around to come runway 35. So we hired the professional pilot, use the same plane Georgina flew, and with our attorney, uh, he is also the pilot, also. He's, he says a co-pilot, and they duplicated it, and we also hired the sound specialist to put the uh, sound, was all the different location, 911 call came in, to record to see how they can hear the Georgina plane, sure. or which scenario could be possible, scenario B, from east to west, or scenario C coming from northeast going to the west. And what did they find? And they found that if Georgina flight path, they could not really hear a zero sound, just normal ambient sound. But when we fly the flight path B and C, they can they, uh, the sound pick up significantly. And matching with the, what people said, plane was very, very low. And the pilot we hired, the professional pilot to take the flight path, he made a comment to our attorney, to whole group, that I never seen the, such a talented pilot under this friendly condition able to fly this flight path. Because he had a hard time flying the Georgina flight path uh, because they had a radar point, point to point. And how she was descending from 5,000 feet to the five miles from the airport. Yes. And he, he was absolutely unbelievably shocked that, wow, how professional she was, how much control she had. And so with with that being said, with these scenarios, and it's obvious that the NTSB basically told you, you know, we're not interested. The FAA, did they ever pursue this possible second aircraft? They did not. We filed a lawsuit against the FAA. So finally, before you go into trial... You know, again, this FAA and NTSB, they do not realize the emotional toll and mental toll take on the family. Yes. For them, it's a joke. Or it's another day, and they just move on to another job, that's it. They absolutely have no feeling for what the family goes through. It took and, about and almost two years or three years back and forth depositions, and finally the, the trial date came. They, call, uh, they say, we agree with you that it was not Georgina's fault. Our controller did a very poor job providing service to Georgina, and we apologize for that. And based on that information, did you file a reconsideration of probable cause and, and send it to the NTSB, given that new information? Exactly. We did that. And NTSB said, absolutely no, it was absolutely Georgina's fault. And they did not produce any papers. So we filed the appeal, and we produced about 1,100 pages of findings. And who did you use? You said you hired uh, you know, your own private folks. Did you hire accident reconstructionists, and did they put together their analysis and what they believe could be a viable, probable cause that you uh, Yes, yeah, so we hired with? the uh, Barnes and Thornsburg attorneys in South Bend office. The attorney who's a pilot, he is in Michigan. Uh, so the attorney and a uh, Biden founder pilot attorney set up the probable cause. They hired the sound, sound system people, I think somewhere from the South. We as a group went to FA in Washington, D.C. to show the other evidence but they said they are not interested or they you have to go through the legal channels. So they won't listen to that we file the lawsuit. And how many people have the resources? And when you are emotionally drained that your eldest daughter, the, the, the best, as far as we are concerned, there's not a single person like her. 
Yeah. And we have to go through this thing to just clear the name. Yeah. And I, I, I told Louis that I will do, we'll do anything, everything. Even if you have to sell our house, you will do that. But we're trying to find out the truth, exactly what happened. Good morning, you're on the ground, Canadian 920. We're just coming up to Alpha Juliet. And with all of that time, effort, and anguish, what was the outcome of all of your appeals throughout this entire process? I think outcome, unfortunately, was zero, zero result. NTSB did not do anything. And unfortunately, we went to the appeal court, circuit court, this is circuit court six in Washington, D.C. And circuit could never do any case against NTSB for 17 years. So they took our case after 17 years. <laughs> and we went to the case. NTSB had about 8 or 10 attorneys sitting in the courtroom. And we had our, our three attorneys. And, and they told judge, the judge, you have no authority to listen to our, this case. You are out of your jurisdiction. We are going to Congress. There is nobody can supervise NTSB. Only the Congress can do that. And finally, judge agreed, saying that, yes, that we can hear your case. And that's it. So we filed the case again in, to the Supreme Court. And Supreme Court also said the same thing. They cannot hear the case because they do not have the jurisdiction over NTSB. And so let me ask a couple questions. First, did you meet with anybody at the NTSB in person, any of the management, the chairman or the office director of aviation there? They um, tried very hard, but they refused. We could not meet anybody. And then have you gone to your congressmen or senators, given the fact that the NTSB does answer to Congress because they're the ones that appropriated? And John can talk about this because he was one of them. Did you ever pursue that avenue? Yeah, we did. Uh, we did went to our local congressman, uh, Jackie Woloski, and at that, uh, at that time, Senator Joe Donnelly. Joe and uh, they did uh, wrote the letter to NTSB to look into it. But nothing came about. And because of this politics, and uh, they had to do other job. So they could never do pursue further. And NTSB, I don't know what they told them. Uh, but nothing came about. So we did try going through the Congress. And that is the reason I also ran in 2018 for U.S. Congress in my district, too. And I thought maybe if I be elected in the Congress, maybe at least I can talk to the other people in the Congress and do something about it. But unfortunately, I did not win. Yeah, it's difficult. But the all the government agencies answer to a committee in Congress, two committees, actually, one in the House of Representatives and the other one in the Senate. And when a committee member, somebody that sits on those committees, contacts the NTSB, that gets their attention immediately because those people control the budget, among other things. We wrote letters to yeah, people did. on the committees. One time, Jackie Walorski said that she was very interested in getting on the Transportation Committee. And then after she reached out, everything just kind of got quiet after that. I don't know what, if it was what they said to her or what, but, right? Yes, that's correct. It's not, it's not her place to invade somebody else's committee. My words, you know, so they, they usually give each other lots of courtesy and uh, not interfere with another committee. But normally you could get a recommendation from your senator and they would arrange a meeting with the committee chairman or the number two on the committee to be heard. But that's that's mute right at this point because those are our trying to get a reconsideration now at this point is very, very unlikely. Right. And when uh, we approached Jackie, it was her first term? Yes, yeah, first term. And I think we tried again her second term. But by then she had gone pretty quiet on us. That's what they do when they can't do anything. Right, and the same with Joe Donnelly. Yeah. I, they don't want to come across, they're, they're pushing some legal thing and, while things are litig uh, litigated. Yeah, I, I wish I had known you 
about this effort back then because we probably could have had taken a little different tact into there. Not when I was a board member, I I had an open door policy. I talked to anybody and everybody. I often answered my own phone, even late at night when I was in there. I often worked late. You didn't answer my call. Yeah, because you're a pain in the. <laughs> Greg, another thing that right now our purpose, so when we filed the lawsuit against FAA, they admitted that they, they gave Georgina, their controller gave Georgina very poor service, and they apologized for that in the writing. In the beginning, they were refused to do that in the writing. They said, we can add your check, and that's it. Now I told them that I'm not interested in any check. I want to know that it was not Georgina's fault. And uh, I need to approach it. If you think your controller did a poor job, they need to admit that. And they did that. And they gave us a, under the Indian law, the maximum settlement was 300000 So I told FAA that what I do with the $300,000, I have no need for that. There's nothing I can do. So I want to give back to FAA so they can use that money for training the controllers. And you know what FAA told me? Wow. They don't have any mechanism to accept that money. I'm willing to give 300,000. I still have 300,000 sitting in the account. And now to give to somebody so they can able to do the proper training. And they want to accept the money. I still have $300,000 to do something about it. So general other people who are flying, general aviation, people benefit. Yeah. Our aim for NTSB is it's not modern anymore. It's just pure... Clean is Georgina name, and in our heart we know, and with FA that is it is not Georgina's fault. Georgina well, did her best, and the second plan happened, well, and uh, we proved beyond our doubt that with our attorney groups, the independent people, they all agreed with me that beyond the doubt there was a second plan at that time, and those the people heard on the East Side of the airport. So our aim is to creating this movie and talking with you and talking to everybody to create the pressure on the Congress that they have to change the rules for the NTSP. At and least the court has some words they say to our NTSP, at least look back again to your university. Well, let's, let's transition to that. What prompted you to make this movie or have this movie made? Do you see this as a bigger voice than what you've been able to project going through the normal channels? I think we, uh, we went through the normal channel, and it was a dead end. We went all up to the Supreme Court. Nothing happened. And the belief that we had, the moment the day accident happened, and DSB, we knew and it coming, that, wow, NTSB is going to investigate. They are the best in the whole world, and we'll find out the truth. And we realized that it is just, just totally myth. That's not the fact. NTSB for the general aviation is just pure mediocre. Mm. And so we want people to know that do not trust or believe NTSB world. Yes, they are the best in the commercial aviation. And we can see that accidents from come down to almost zero in USA for so many years. Uh, look at NTSB when they put their mind together to align the seat belt in the car, there were so many deaths. Same as NTSB went put the mind together for putting the airbag in the car. We only so many deaths. So if the NTSB put their mind set to solve the problems, they can do it. But some reason their mindset for the general aviation is done. They really don't give a damn if one people get killed or five people get killed. They don't care. It's a blame the pilot error. And so they can move on to the next operation because that's where they don't have to make any recommendation to FAA to make improve the flight safety for general aviation. Yeah, it's not that they don't care. It's a question of resources. All right, so on the big airplanes, they have a full staff of all the specialties that go into transport category airplanes. But on the general aviation staff, it's mostly pilots. Then our goal is reduce the scope. No, I think, but uh, Greg and John, I think NTSB did send two people. They spent the money. They sent two professional FAA people to investigate the report. Those two FAA investigators, they wrote the report. 
Okay, but you, you teach don't mix apples and oranges. The NTSB, yes, they, they invite the, the FAA as an automatic party. The FAA has a whole different mission when they go out to investigate with the board. They have nine areas of responsibility, which are from the oversight and enforcement perspective versus NTSB, which are basically fact collectors. And where the crossover occurs is while the board will use on a very regular basis, they don't have enough resources. They actually do, because if there was an air traffic issue, all the investigator had to do was make a phone call back to Washington and ask for the air traffic specialist to look into the issues with the FAA that the FAA eventually admitted to. They could have found that out during the investigation. It's just that when you have certain investigators out there, especially those who don't have a lot of experience, they'll take the obvious evidence, they take the easiest route, they put it in a package and call it good. And like you said before, and John and I have talked about before, they don't really take into account the effect that their failure to do a thorough and methodical investigation, they don't take into effect what that has on the family or the reputation of a pilot. And while that has no place in the final probable cause or even the analysis, the fact is, is that you as a taxpayer for that organization, because your tax dollars are going to fund that organization, you expect the highest quality investigation. And it's obvious that based on your own findings and the, and the money you've spent to, to get new information, that the board should have gotten that at taxpayers' expense because they're being paid by the taxpayers. And it's, it's just sad. So, With this movie, tell us about this movie as we close this discussion. Tell us about this movie and what it's about and where people can find it. Well, the movie is about the journey that Yatish and Louise went through from the night they got the phone call until the time that Yatish and I decided, well, once we exhausted everything we could legally, and yet we still felt the need to get the word out, We just started talking to, we interviewed a number of film makers in the area and decided who we thought could help us tell the story the best. And, you know, when you see a plane go overhead or when you read every week, right, about a crash, we just don't want it to dismiss, you know, people to dismiss it as, well, that'll never be me. I'll never go on a private plane. We want them to realize that that plane could end up That could be your friend, that could be your neighbor, that plane could end up on your house, on your kid's school. These are things that really impact all of us. And so what can we do? We just can't point the finger and say pilot error for such a vast majority of the time. 86% 86 of the time. Yeah, 86% of the time. And since in the way people view movies today and documentaries are – Not what they were 30 years ago, like, oh, Dad, don't make me watch one. They're a big part of what people watch on Netflix or Prime or whatever streaming you use. And so we thought that made it very accessible for us to get in front of people. We also, if it hadn't been COVID time, uh, we were working on local film festivals uh, that are held throughout communities all over the country. purpose is to hopefully they can, everybody can call their congressman to put some pressure on the Congress to make some changes to make general aviation safe for everybody. Right. Realizing and, that this is a problem that impacts much more than the few that we assume it does. And who is in this in this movie? I presume I know you and Joan are, Yatish, but who else is in the movie with you that talks to this story? I think uh, one of the Georgina fans was in the plane, Gurkil, his parents. The flight instructor, flight, uh, flight instructor, the, uh, uh, the engineer who took the sound recordings, and the attorneys. As well as a reporter from the USA Today who has really featured a number of stories about the phenomena of quote-unquote pilot error. And a Georgina teacher from the 
London, Bloomington, and South Bend. And did you have any of the feds, any of the FA or NTSB folks make comments? We asked the them and they denied. They refused to interview or be in the film. I guess that in and of itself is kind of telling. <laughs> but you know what? You have an opportunity coming up. We have a new Congress coming in in January. Just in a couple, three weeks, we'll have a whole new bunch of senators and, and uh, congressmen. And with the film out, you're going to need to orchestrate the play, first off. So you can go up and, and leave copies of the film with the staff for the committees, the Senate Commerce Committee or the House Transportation Committee. You need to talk to the staffers because you probably won't get to the Congressman DeFazio. There's too many office roadblocks. But you can talk to the staff and let them know that the, the investigations that the NTSB is doing on general aviation are not the best in the world and that they need to be better. And then you use those, those voices of the people that have been out seeing the film. You would have to coordinate that so that they then send their letters to Congressman DeFazio or, or Senator Weicker and light a little fire under them that there's enough support out there that it'd be worth their political effort to do something. And another avenue to pursue, if you haven't done it, is contact AOPA. Not only are they advocates for general aviation, but they track congressmen and senators who are actually pilots. And even though they may not sit on a transportation type committee, because they are pilots or have some interest in aviation, it may be worth also contacting them because of course, they're looking as a general aviation pilot. It's their community, and, and it's their responsibility. So maybe they, too, can add some fire to this fight to make change. Well, we're working on AOPA already, but thank you for your suggestions regarding Senator Weicker and Congressman DeFazio. That's where the pressure point is on the NTSB, and that's also where the money for NTSB operations come from. Yeah, and John, you know, he knows. The chairman has to go up and sit before all of those folks and justify their existence. And they ask questions about what the board has accomplished. And while they do give them the proverbial, we, we made these recommendations, we improved highway safety, we did this, that, and the other. If there is very pointed evidence that is not only daughter's accident, but other accidents that demonstrates failures, inadequacies, and things like that, then all of a sudden somebody's going to go, well, wait a minute here. This isn't a one-off. This is a trend. This is a problem. What are you going to do to fix it? Is there any way we could write in conjunction with you since you have other investigations going now? Or would, would that dilute it or would that increase the... Well, I think I think through the movie, let's I think John and I can definitely talk to you offline. But the big thing here is making your voice big based on fact. John and I have been in the business long enough. Yes. And, and even for my family, if something were to happen to me, I really wouldn't want the NTSB investigating it. I'd rather have people that I trust do the investigation because they will do a thorough and methodical. The fact is, is that we work in a fact world. The board works in a fact world. And if they aren't doing their job to collect all the facts, conditions, and circumstances, then that needs to be demonstrated to the powers to be who can actually affect change. And, and that's really what it's all about is, is collecting enough factual information. And trust me, that in and of itself won't be hard. You know, I, when I looked at all the, the pieces that you guys sent to me through uh, Jerry, uh, Gary and uh, I watched the film a couple of times, the on-scene portion of the investigation has some holes, but it basically strongly looked like the airplane was stalled. So I can understand where they were going. But when you presented all that additional evidence at the end with the sound, the recordings, and not only just the witness statements, but verified what they heard, verified the directions, you had a more thorough fact-based investigation than they had. And why they didn't reconsider 
what they did, what they looked at, is beyond belief. It defies description. So the initial one, what I'm trying to say, the initial investigation, it wasn't the best, but it wasn't the worst. But when they failed to take into consideration all of that additional evidence that you presented, then it definitely doesn't make them look very good. Where, uh, and, and just wrapping this up, where can uh, this movie be viewed, seen? How can people that uh, in our audience watch this, this show? Okay, if you have Apple TV, you can view it on Apple TV. Okay. Um, you can get it on Amazon Prime and Netflix. And YouTube as well, at least the trailer. I just watched it today on, on uh, Refresh My Memory on YouTube. Quick question, YouTube. gentlemen. So how, how close is the length of the Department of Transportation to the NTSB? No, none. Not? Not, not at all. Okay. NTSB is an independent agency. What that means is they do not have a cabinet secretary that sits over them. So as a board member, the five board members, of which I was one, we are what they call direct reports to the White House. There's not many agencies that are in that position. Most agencies, almost 99% of the federal government reports to some sort of a cabinet secretary. But there are, there are a scattering of small agencies that report to the White House. So that's where the pressure points are, the White House and Congress. And Congress is the, is the one that uh, has the most to say about the agencies. So when I said to you about Tafazio and about a Senate Commerce Committee, since they're the ones that essentially enable the NTSB to exist, because they have to reapprove the NTSB every five years, and every year they have to approve their budget, they are very interested in anything that goes on in those agencies because it can have an effect on them. So a politician doesn't want to have to become involved with a big uh, press scandal that's involving their office around an agency that they have some control over. So uh, that's why they they uh, they write heard on it. I mean, I can tell you that I I receive calls from. Uh, the Senate Commerce Committee in particular, a few times from the House, but more often from the Senate Commerce Committee, about an accident that I was working or asking for facts about an accident. And the calls were not to influence any of the decisions. In fact, frankly, a few of the calls would actually make sure that nobody was trying to influence my actions. You know, I had, had one of our senators actually call me and and asked me that question pointedly was somebody putting any pressure on me for the investigation that I was involved in. And I said, no. And his answer was to me, if anybody tries to influence your decision, you call me. And he gave me his personal cell phone. So that's how much they, they, they watch. And that's why I, I've said to you two or three times now that the pressure points are the House and Senate committees that oversee the NTSB. And so as non-residents to either of those people's voting base, will we have much luck? Yeah, yes, you will. We will, yes. okay. Yes, you will. It oftentimes is better if you're in the state, but I've often heard the Senate particularly call the club. There's only a hundred of them, and they do watch out for each other, despite all the, the uh, what you see in the press and all the, the posturing you see. They do watch out for one another. So... Yes, you, you need to talk to the staff members, get them to understand what's going on. You know, you need a lot of leave-behinds because talking is uh, forgotten very quickly. So you need to go in with a package of material and give them and follow up with it. you got to keep the pressure on for them to do something. And a new Congress is the best time to do that. So you need to, you need to get in there early before they get inundated with all sorts of, of other interests. And yours is a very motherhood and apple pie kind of issue because you're not any longer looking for anything for yourself. This reconsideration is now long gone. It's, it's not going to happen. But what you're saying is that you need to, to help others not go through the same misadventure that you had to go through. And your focus is to get the resources to the NTSB so that they can treat a general aviation accident at the same level that they do business and commercial aviation. That's correct. 
Well, we want to thank you very much for sharing your story, Yatish and Joan. It's, um, it is a compelling story. And as I've said before, John and I bring these kinds of issues up all the time because uh, general aviation is a vital part of our overall aviation system. And it deserves the highest levels of oversight, enforcement, and, of course, investigation so that we can improve safety. I mean, that is the function of the safety board and uh, the efforts that you made to at least present new facts should have been heard and the pushback shouldn't have existed. And uh, so we applaud your effort. And I'm glad that our listeners will be able to at least view the movie and, and make up their own mind. You know, there will be the, the skeptics and, and that kind of stuff, which is to be expected. But we try to uh, we try to present a platform, and in this case, it's a platform for you, to at least tell your side of the story. Because John and I are always talking from the professional investigator side of the story or an airline or a manufacturer. So we're, uh, we're very happy that uh, you took the time to uh, come on the show and present Georgina's story and all of your efforts. So hopefully, John and I have dealt with red tape as our as we had to do in the NTSB many a day. And um, we're hoping that maybe now the voice can get a little louder and change can actually happen. So again, thank you both very much for, uh, for being on the show with us today. And Simon, we really appreciate talking to us and I really, really appreciate what you're doing for general aviation. Thank you. For our listeners, I'd like to remind them that this show has been brought to them by Avemco Insurance, who goes to great lengths to promote safety in aviation by sponsoring a number of safety events, including the FAA's WINGS program, among others. And if you're looking for insurance for your airplanes, Avemco Insurance will give you a 5% discount just for listening to flight safety detectives. So if you are looking for insurance, you can give them a call at 888 888- 879-0389, or you can always get them on the web at fmco.com. Well, my friend, I think it's uh, another great show. Interesting to hear a family perspective, which uh, we don't often get. And I'm hoping that our listeners have benefited from it because we reach a lot of people, both per- personally and professionally with what we do. The show gives us another avenue to do that as well. And hopefully this has enlightened people because this isn't just about guys like you and me trying to do the right thing. It's about families trying to do the right thing as well. So, again, I always appreciate it. And I hope that our listeners appreciate it and give us the feedback. You can always contact us at our email at flight safety detectives with an S at gmail.com. Tell us what you thought of the show. Give us ideas for future shows. But again, we try to bring interesting perspectives to aviation and aviation safety. And I think today's show was one of those interesting perspectives. So my friend, as always, I will leave you with the last words. Okay. Well, tonight I have a little different one. I would encourage everybody to go on YouTube or Apple TV or wherever And look at this film. It is very, very compelling. It's an hour, a little more than an hour long, and it is very, very compelling. It is called Invisible Sky. Yes, I should have said that. And That's why I'm here. That's why you have me here. Okay. And with that, in our personal lives, please wear a mask. Keep your hands clean. We're getting close to the end of this. My personal fear is I've been very diligent. I've been locked up in my apartment and not gone very far for the last nine months. I don't want to get this in the last few weeks before the vaccine is widely available. So please, everybody, this is a very trying time. It's the holidays. We all want to be out and about. We all want to mix with our families. But please take all the the cautions. It's all about managing risk, just like there is when flying. So please take all the cautions on your personal life, And if you do fly, please fly safely. To listen to more episodes of the show, go to flightsafetydetectives.com. 
or the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association at PAMA.org and wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Catch us next time when John Golia and Greg Fife talk about all things aviation. Thanks for listening.